Listen, I'm not saying these five players are bad. They're going to be bad at fantasy football. But every fantasy league has that one person who goes up to the draft board, puts the sticker onto the board, and then turns around and, hey, you guys didn't know he's the fucking wide receiver too in Buffalo. And a whole lot of that fucking energy is coming back at these guys who draft these five players. Because these are definitely five of those players that are going to end up on draft boards where that person turns around and gives you that fucking face, all right? So for the most part, we're staying away from these guys because the people who think they're smart are going to be overdrafting. They're going to be overreaching for these guys. And Gabriel Davis is the first guy up on this list. Your smart-ass league mate will say he's the number two in Buffalo now. And according to the data from Mr. Dwayne McFarland, He's got seven players who are going earlier in high to mid stakes drafts. So you have a few guys and Gabriel Davis is number six in terms of the discrepancy between where he's going in FFPC, which is high stakes, actual paid leagues and ESPN. So he's going 25 spots higher in paid leagues, number 51 overall. That is a premium pick to use on Mr. Gabriel Davis, who had like one really big game last year. I don't want to take it all away from him, but I think it's really important when you start to look at these players where you're not really sure what to make of a boom bust type week like he had last year in the playoffs you look at the individual player and I think that kind of tells you what the ceiling could be so we look at Matt Harmon's reception perception as we always do and in terms of a separator he's not very very good he's in the 33rd percentile against man he's in the 36th percentile against press and you know his teammate on the other side of the ball is in like the 97th percentile for all those he just does not separate he does not win against defensive backs at least on a separation level does that mean he can't be a contested catch guy does that mean he can't be a big playmaker down the field that simply just outruns people no it doesn't but it makes it a lot harder and these are backed up by player profilers individual objective stats as well route win rate number 67 in the nfl win rate versus man 54th in the nfl just all that kind of stuff so when i look at buffalo i'll be honest like i want all the digs this year i want all the digs and then if i'm targeting more people in the passing it's actually pretty much everyone outside of gabe davis i'll like i'll take dawson knox in the ninth round I'll, i'm interested in whoever's a slot wide receiver here uh, i thought it was gonna be jameson crowder reports surfaced recently that isaiah mckenzie is the one running with the ones but those are guys you can get in the 12th 13th round and this is not an offense that runs two wide receiver sets. It's an offense that's going to pass a lot. And this offense is going to have a lot of passing production, but it's not going to be siphoned to just two dudes. Last year, over 80% of the plays run in Buffalo had at least three wide receivers on the field. They were second in the NFL in four wide receiver sets. They're not going to be a ground and pound team, obviously. And I get it. I get it. He's shown signs over the first two years in the NFL that he could be a big time playmaker and have these boomer bust weeks. But I don't feel confident enough in boomer bust players to take them in the fourth in the fourth round because I think that's where eventually his ADP is headed to. We hear one like camp report about how good he looks. Boom. He's been in the league for two years, and he's been tied to one of the best quarterbacks in the league for those two years, and he has yet to top 35 catches or 600 receiving yards in a season. It's like just how often does taking a four to six game sample size and flattening it out over the course of the season work in fantasy football? The answer is almost never. I think Matt Harmon put it really well at the bottom of his reception perception on Gabriel Davis. He said the last outcome sounds pretty reasonable for Davis, and he was talking about a comparison to Devontae Parker as a player, and would be just fine as a fringe 100 target guy for the Bills who split the complementary duties behind Stefan Diggs with others. With all factors in mind, I'd advise not coming down too aggressively on either side of the fence in this projection. Your league mate will think he's the smartest fucking dude on the planet for taking Gabe Davis. I think a lot of that can be said with Alan Lazard of the Green Bay Packers as well. Admittedly, he was someone I was very, very high on in the beginning of the year. I was just kind of throwing numbers together and saying like, Devontae Adams is out. Aaron Rodgers is talking about how Alan Lazard is going to be the number one here. This feels like another case of us trying to flatten out these limited sample sizes into a full season and, and longevity and consistency over the long period of time is something that we need to value more as fantasy players. And we've never seen that from Alan Lazard. So let's just start right there. And in terms of who he is as a separator, we're going to do the same exact analysis that we just did for Gabe Davis for Alan Lazard, right? This is taking quarterback play out of the equation. This is taking offensive snaps, situations, pace, offensive line, blocking all that shit out of the equation. Just looking at these guys as separators. Lazard not ranking very highly anywhere across the board. Total route wins, route win rate win rate versus man and then you look at the reception perception 15th percentile versus man 10th versus zone 27th versus press that is literally the opposite of Devonte adams and i think my good friend sal uh made a nice little thread here on alan lazard which kind of just backs up these numbers lazard hasn't displayed the skills to be the guy he averages just 4.6 targets per game without Devonte adams which would have ranked outside the top 60 wide receivers in 2021 he finished as the 80th overall wide receiver in efficiency last year, 63rd at beating man coverage. It's just a lot of things that probably point to Alan Lazard might be forced into the wide receiver one role to start the year simply because they have nothing else going on there. But 
But to expect someone in this offense to be like the Jordy Nelson, the Devontae Adams is really, really insanely optimistic. So I think what we're going to see is Lazar probably plays a ton of snaps this year, runs a ton of routes. But I think more often than not, we're going to see like seven targets, five catches and like 42 yards without a score. I think we'll see a lot of games like that. I think the upside is probably him finishing with like 10 touchdowns because it's Aaron Rodgers. But I think more often than not, we'll be disappointed because he has trouble separating from most coverages. Third guy up on this list, it's another wide receiver. We got a, we got a lot of wide receivers that your league mates think they're fucking smart for taking, but they're not. Okay. And if you're enjoying the video thus far, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you're new. We shall continue on the Juju, Juju shit Schuster over here in Kansas City. And you've got your league mates being like, he's the number one now in Kansas City. It's like according to fucking who? Ian Hartitties over here hit this on the head. He said, I think the most likely scenario is Kelsey goes bonkers, while Sky Moore, MVS, Juju, Miko Hardman probably are all good, not great. The assumption that Juju just zooms to the front of that whole wide receiver room continues to be wild to me. And I couldn't agree more. I think we'll have like two of these guys probably go for 800 to 850 receiving yards. One of them go for like 600, one for 500. We have no idea where the touchdowns are going to be dispersed to. A lot of them are going to go to Kelsey. I bet you Mahomes probably runs the ball a little bit more. But here's the reality of the situation. Juju has just not been good on a football field since 2018. Some of it's injury related, but we've also seen a full season of him 16 games two years ago where he was not good at all except for scoring a few extra touchdowns than he normally does. But receptions and targets and, and per target base efficiency was absolutely not there we've also never seen him be really good when Antonio Brown wasn't operating on the other side of the field to take away all of that attention and I think realistically uh his focus got away from football the last few years it really really did he was more about being a celebrity and less about being in training shape and and worrying about football 24 7 man he really really cared more about being a celebrity and just like not to be fucking weird here and obviously I'm nowhere near this stature but as we grow as a brand this is you know some weird internal shit but as we grow as a brand like I'm getting way more personal opportunities in terms of um, just things that I have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I have to be on calls with whether it's fucking new brands or sponsors or uh, go here to to do like a speaking engagement or talk to lawyers here or tighten up the, you know, talk to our web developers and then our video content people and then our editing people. There's a lot of me being pulled in different directions. And if you let yourself subside into that, you will have a lasting effect on the other stuff that you do. So this summer, I've been trying to be way more focused on uh, the content and not so much dive into all the other things that have not gotten us to where we are now, if that makes sense. So I think Juju probably veered off the path a little bit and it hurts your focus, okay? So I think, again, we're just gonna see a mix of guys with good games, bad games, decent seasons, okay seasons. But Juju, like sixth round Juju is just not something I want a part of when you can get any of those guys two, three, five, six rounds after. Number four on this list, we shall get to the QB position, and that is Mr. Justin Fields of the Chicago Bears. So everyone's going to be like, this is this is basically the way that your, uh, that your league mates are going to feel when they draft Justin Fields, okay? My problem with Justin Fields is this. When you look at basically every metric from last year, he was awful. And we'll throw him on the, on the screen right now, but adjusted yard per attempt, 28th. Accuracy rating, 33rd. True completion rate, 33rd. Under pressure completion rate, 29th. Play action completion rate, 32nd. Clean pocket completion rate, 29th. True pass rating, 31st. QBR, 31st. Catchable pass rate, 31st. Deep ball accuracy rating, 25th. Okay. So we want to be here and be jolly and be like, he's going to progress as a quarterback. And that's fine. Like he might be a super ass talented quarterback, but the Chicago Bears are throwing a rock on top of this dude's head by not helping him what so fucking ever. You know, they put no, no resources into helping him on the outside for more pass catching weapons. They literally brought in like fucking Byron Pringle, who gets arrested immediately after signing him. They bring in Nikhil Harry. Like, what are they doing here? So you're thinking, OK, they don't spend the resources on the weapons. They got to do it for the offensive line. Right. Right. Wrong. They don't address the fucking offensive line at all. He's going to be under pressure 24 fucking seven in 2022. No weapons, no offensive line. Can he be talented? Yes. Is he going to improve this year? Hard to, hard to make the case that he's going to be a better passer this year than he was last year, given they've given that they've given him nothing. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Most people don't just take steps forward without having the other pieces around them help them. So I'm very, very worried about Justin Fields. I'm very worried that we just see a few spike weeks. We see a lot of rushing happening. We did see over the second half of the year, he got a lot more involved in the rushing game. He actually averaged, I believe, over 50 rushing yards per game over his last six or seven games. And even in that time span, he was like the quarterback 19. So he was a borderline QB 20 when he was averaging over 50 rushing yards per game. He had more interceptions and touchdowns. And again, the only thing he's got working for him on offense is, is 
like is Darnell Mooney, 175 pound wide receiver. So it's going to be ugly again in Chicago for that whole team, the passing game with Justin Fields in particular. Your friend will think he's smart as hell because Justin Fields can run the ball. George Kittle is the last player up on this list. And I think people are going to say, oh, I get George Kittle in the fourth round, in the fifth round. What a discount. I'm so fucking schmott. I have big concerns with George Kittle. One, you have the injury history, right? He's starting to pile on injury year after injury year after injury year over the last three years, right? He had that monster 2018, but over the last three years, he has missed on average over four games per season. So that's concern number one, but I'm not going to sit here and try to project injuries. What I'm more concerned about actually, which might sound weird, but is Trey Lance under center, man, because Jimmy G is not taking off and eating up rush attempts when he's under center. Jimmy G missed most of 2020. He only played like five or six games. So we filter that out. But 2019 and 2021, when he was the full starter for 16, 17 games, the 49ers ranked 31st and 31st in pass attempts per game and overall passing rate. So that's with a borderline immobile quarterback or super, super run heavy. Now you're adding in Trey Lance, who basically averaged over 12 rushes per game last year. This is probably going to be the most run heavy offense in the NFL. And they didn't really have room for margin to actually increase there, but they're about to. And I look back over the last five years, okay? And the team that finished dead last in the NFL in pass attempts per game, on average, threw the ball 27 and a half times. You start to split up 27, 28, 29 pass attempts between Debo, Kittle, Ayuk, some shit third wide receiver and shit second tight end, and then three or four running backs. And that piece of the pie gets eaten real quickly. The other underlying problem I see is that they're also not a fast-paced offense, right? Shanahan was fast-paced when he was in Atlanta, and he was a little bit when he first got to the 49ers. But over the last two years, they have ranked bottom five in, in pace and bottom five in just overall plays because they're running a slow offense. You might say like, you know, Trey Lance is athletic and Trey Lance uh, might move the needle there and they'll go more fast-paced because he is athletic. But I think the fast-paced offense becomes a thing when the coach actually trusts the quarterback and when you give over the keys to the offense when you let them go more no more no huddle and you go faster pace that's what you're doing is like you're kind of taking yourself out of the equation saying like I trust you to run the offense to call the right plays to move this thing quickly and up to now like we have seen nothing between Shanahan and Trey Lance or just this organization and Trey Lance to feel like they trust him whatsoever so it's volume and also like when George Kittle broke out in 2018 they've added some serious weapons to the offense, right? Like Debo just went for almost 1,800 yards from scrimmage last year. So Debo is a true number one. I we don't really know what he is at this point, but at worst, he's probably like a, a, a good role possession receiver in this offense. So super run heavy. It's a slow offense. We don't know what Trey Lance is going to be as a passer. That's, you know, those targets getting divvied up, like even if they're accurate targets. So I'm worried about George Kittle. Man, it's a super, super small sample size, but we saw the two games that they played together last year. George Kittle went four for 40 and one for 29. So I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm trying to get cute. I don't think I'm trying to get smart with George Kittle this year. I'm going to let somebody else draft him. I'd rather Darren Waller. I'd rather Dalton Schultz two rounds later as well. So those are five players that your idiot league mates are going to think they're smart for drafting, but you just sit back there and hit them with a fucking double bird when they turn around from that draft board slapping that sticker on it all right what i want y'all to do is go slap the subscribe button if you're new we're coming out with videos like this every single day i love you and i'm out of here